Good morning. Our first scripture lesson is taken from the 8th chapter of Romans, verses 1 through 11. Let us then hear the word of the Lord. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law must be fulfilled in, um, in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh put their minds on the things of the flesh, But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit of life is peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to the God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will receive, give you life to your mortal bodies as though his spirit, through his spirit that dwells in you. Our second reading and text for our sermon is taken from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, reading verses 22 through 30. Here again the word of the Lord. Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. When once the owner of the house has got up and shut the door, and you will begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then, in reply, he will say to you, I do not know where you came from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrown out. Then people will come from east and west, from north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. While clearing out the books in my office, getting ready for the new carpeting that is being put in the office, I came across the book by Dr. Chris Thurman called The Lies We Believe. Because I had planned to retire at the end of June, I had been preaching using the text from the Common Lectionary since Palm Sunday. There's no sense in starting a series when I was going to be ending after that period of time. Since I'll be here to the end of September, I realized I could use some of his thoughts as a basis for a series on the lies society tells us and the scriptures that refute those lies. So here we go with the lie that tells us we can have it all. A salesman was driving through Kentucky when he noticed a man and his small daughter sitting by a brook. It looked like a pleasant place, so he stopped his car and he approached the two. As he looked at the brook, he said to the the farmer, you have a lovely little daughter. What's her name? The farmer replied, Christina Ann Marie. 
The farmer said, is that all one word or multiple names? And he said, no, it's one name. And they asked her, do you call her something for short? And the farmer said, mister, we're not city folks. We've got time to call people by their proper names. I don't know many people today, whether in the city or the country, who don't seem to be pressed for time. A survey sometimes back found uh, 58% of the U.S. population has too much to do. 70% of the people in the 30 to 44 age group describe themselves as rushed and pressured for time. No surprise there. Why do we feel so rushed and pressured? Maybe it's because years ago a beer commercial started telling us that we could have it all. Now they were talking about having a light beer that had, would have full taste of uh, a beer that had all the calories. But some people tried to have it all. And you know what they found? No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't do it. You can't have it all. You still have to make choices. Experts say that that may be why so many people feel so tired, so pressured, simply because there are too many choices in life. It's estimated that the average American is hit with over 5,000 advertisements a day. Merely working our way through the mail and email can be a chore. 200 new products hit supermarket shelves every week. Cable TV offers hundreds of channels, and Internet streaming services offer hundreds more. Plus, all you have to do is get on the internet and look at YouTube and other similar services, and you have just as many offerings. In short, the sheer number of options and the task of sorting through those options becomes exhausting. In an age when we want to do it all and miss nothing, the price of our self-imposed demands is very heavy. We cannot say no lest we miss something. And so our many options and our indecision combine to make us feel overwhelmed. Jesus tells us right up front that we can't have it all. And strive to enter by the narrow door, he says. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Jesus wasn't being a spoil sport. He was simply being honest with us. We can't have it all. We can't carry a lot of stuff through a narrow door. I've experienced this greatly since my shoulder surgery. Now I only have to wear the brace for short periods of time, but at first it was tough. The pillow under the brace pushed my arm out wide and I had to carry anything in my left hand. So fitting through doorways and closing them was tough. At the same time, however, Jesus tells us that we can have more than we ever dreamed. We can have everything that is important. We can score where it really counts. The door to successful living is always a narrow one. We all have heard the phrase, jack of all trades and master of none. A jack of all trades can be very handy to have around when simple repairs need to be done. But if great skill and expertise is needed, that person probably was not the one for the job. Many student athletes who enjoy multiple sports will be told that they will need to make a choice between them by the time they get to the college level if they really want to excel and if they want to get a scholarship. Consider that thought, thought for a moment, and you will know it to be true. Many come to life's open doors, but only a few make it through. Good example, thousands of, upon thousands of young boys grow up bouncing basketballs and dreaming of life in the NBA. But only a handful will be true, chosen each year. The same thing is true for football and baseball and other sports like soccer and uh, some of the women's sports. Woe unto the young man or young woman who is talented at sports but neglects his or her education. Because sports will probably not take them very far. And keeping your priorities straight is important too. A young man in the community I served in had won a track scholarship to a major university, 
but he was told specifically that he would have to not play football his senior year of high school in order to keep it. They could not risk having him get hurt. If he got hurt doing something other than running track, he would lose the scholarship. He had been a wide receiver in high school and also the team's kicker. His replacement was a, as a kicker turned out to be a disappointment. And the coach talked him into coming back to do just the kicking. On a field goal attempt, there was a bad snap. The holder struggled to get the ball in place, so it took a while. And as the young man's leg came forward to kick the ball, the defender blocked the ball and clipped his leg. He fell awkwardly and tore up his knee very badly. He lost a full ride college scholarship because of a small bit of hope for high school glory. Not the best choice by either the coach, who had a tendency of taking advantage of his athletes, or the young man himself. He should have been able to look at the scholarship, not playing football. The door to successful living is a narrow win. Life is a continual challenge. Why then should we be surprised at Jesus when asked, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Answered, strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. I do, no, do you no favor, favor as a pastor if I tell you differently. You cannot have it all, but you can have everything that really matters if you recognize it. Successful living requires making hard choices. It requires dedication and sacrifice. The late Arnold Palmer, shortly after he uh, died, was heralded as, as one of America's finest golfers ever. He and Jack Nicholson and now Tiger Woods sort of are the epi epitome of things. Wouldn't it be great to be a natural athlete like someone once described Arnold Palmer? And again, in that article about him after he died, it said that he practiced golf eight hours a day, day after day after day. Being a great golfer requires commitment. Some of you who play the game are thinking to yourself that even being a poor golfer requires commitment. You don't excel in athletics or anything else unless you are willing to pay the price. To continue on sports again for a moment, NBA Hall of Famer Larry Bird was voted several times the most valuable player in uh, the league, basketball league. How did he achieve his excellence? He was legendary for his dedication to practicing the game. An opposing player tells of arriving at the Boston Garden with his teammates to play the Boston Celtics several hours before an important game. There was the great Larry Bird standing at the foul line of a dark, deserted Boston Garden practicing free throws over and over and over again. There's a joke about some of the big men of NBA history like uh, um, Will Chamberlain and like uh, Shaq who were miserable making free throws. And very often the way to beat the team was to foul them because they had a tough time making free throws. Larry Bird knew that. He wasn't about to be fouled intentionally without making the other team pay a price. The coach of the opposing team preached a little sermon on seeing Larry there shooting those free throws. He used him as an example of preparation. Sometime later, that same team returned to Boston to play the Celtics again. This time, they arrived a day early and went immediately to Boston Garden to practice. The garden was cold and empty. Larry Bird was not at the free throw line. Okay, coach, chided one of the players. Where's Larry Bird? The other players laughed a little bit and gave him a hard time because of what he had said. Where's the super dedicated Larry Bird? The coach smiled quite naturally, and uh, then one of the players said, Hold it, guys. I think I hear something. Everyone got real quiet. It was then they noticed the solitary figure running laps on the top row of the stands of Boston Garden. 
It was Larry Bird. Successful living requires commitment. It requires dedication. It's true in athletics. It's true in business. It's in true in life itself and family life. The philosopher Goethe once said, everyone wants to be somebody. Nobody wants to grow into being that someone. He's right. We want gain without pain, triumph without really trying, success without suffering. But life does not work that way. The door is narrow. That's true in sports, in business, in family life. Why should it not be true in our relationship with God? It appears to me that there is a great temptation today to settle for a sentimental, sloppy religion that soothes us, caresses us, and requires nothing of us. We forget the symbol of the Christian faith is not a cushioned pew, but a cross. Successful living requires commitment. Successful living requires making hard choices. Somebody's probably thinking, did pastor get up on the wrong side of the bed this morning? Who says you can't have it all? The answer is any mature, rational human being has to say it. You can't abuse your body with tobacco or alcohol or drugs or too much sugar or too little exercise and still be in great shape. You have to choose. You can't be an effective salesperson and sit in Starbucks sipping coffee all morning. You can't build a lasting relationship with your spouse and compromise your wedding vows. Successful living requires making hard choices. Many of us do not want to make the hard choices that life requires of us. Psychologists tell us that is why so many of us procrastinate. We want to put off facing the pain of making choices. That is a sure formula for failure. Successful people recognize that making hard choices is a key to successful living. Even Jesus had to make a hard choice. Several weeks ago, we read uh, the text, Father, if it, be any, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But nonetheless, not my will, but thine be done. The sweat rolled off his body like great drops of blood in that garden of Gethsemane. I'm confident that if Jesus had turned his back at that moment, we would never have heard of him again. That is the way life is. He could have gone back to his father Joseph's old carpenter shop and spent his life as a simple carpenter. But if he was going to save the world, he was going to have to give his life's blood on Calvary. No pain, no gain. A somewhat dated editorial in the Salvation Army's War Cry magazine many years ago put it like this. A loose wire gives out no musical note. But fasten the ends, and the piano, the harp, the violin is born. Free steam drives no machine, but confine it and hamper it with piston and turbine, and you have the great world of machinery made possible. The unhampered river drives no dynamos, but dam it up, and you get power sufficient to light a great city. So our lives must be disciplined if we are to be of any real service in the world. Some people try to live in two worlds. St. Paul called them the world of the flesh or sin and the world of the spirit in our text from Romans 8. But listen to the, again, the door isn't wise enough, wide enough for you to get through carting two worlds. You must choose. If you're going to walk with Jesus, there are some things that you may need to leave behind. In some cases, it may be totally unfitting kinds of things, activities that are not morally fitting for following Christ. In other cases, they are fundamentally good things, but they threaten to sidetrack us from what God wants us to do. Things like hobbies and sports can have a proper place in our lives to help us relax, avoid stress, or provide needed exercise. But any time they push Christ from the center of our lives or away from something we know God wants us to do, then we either push them back to their proper place or we have to jettison them altogether. 
While I was serving in Paxton, Illinois, a covenant pastor in our south Chicago district told me of the frustration he experienced with a potential call to another church. This was before the church he went to. The church chair was also the chair of the pulpit committee, uh, a situation which the covenant has found to be problematic because mixing the two jobs can be tough because each of them require a lot of effort. That's why our chairman takes care of the church and our vice chair is head of our call committee. In any case, he got a call from a church chairman inquiring about his availability. He was interested. In fact, he knew he ultimately needed to move because of family responsibility. But the process dragged on and on, not knowing what was causing the delay and having never even met with the pulpit committee and knowing he had a need to be moving on, an inquiry from another church came. He met with the pulpit committee. He got uh, the call to candidate. He did so, and he ended up accepting the call to the church. Sometime later, he found out from someone in that first church that the committee had wanted to move quickly, but the chair had so many things on his own personal calendar that the business of the church got put on the back burner. Again, they may have been good things, and if I remember the story correctly, because that's looking back almost 20 years ago, some of the things were his children's and his own sporting events and community responsibilities that he had accepted besides his leadership of the church and of the pulpit committee. But the net result is that the church missed out on a very capable pastor. I have a very high regard for this particular person. Again, they may have had been good things that got in the way, but if the chairman didn't have time to do for the church what was necessary to call a pastor, he should have allowed someone else to serve in his place. The fact is, when God calls, many good things have to be pushed to the side, at least temporarily. Our great temptation is to try to live in two worlds, but the door is narrow. It requires commitment. It requires making hard choices. But listen to a paradox. The door is narrow, but it's wide enough for all who truly want to enter. Nobody has to be excluded like we're excluded in the text. It makes no difference what your past has been. It makes no difference who you are or what you have or have not accomplished, this door is big enough for you by faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. A cartoon appeared on an editorial page of many newspapers around the country on the occasion of the celebration of Abraham Lincoln's 200th birthday on February 12, 2009. The cartoon showed a humble log cabin. Above the log cabin was a ladder, At the top of the ladder was drawn the White House. Underneath the cartoon was this caption, The ladder is still there. That's my closing word to you this morning. The ladder is still there. The door is still open. It's still wide enough to admit all who would enter. You and I cannot have it all, but we can have everything that really matters. Successful living requires commitment. It requires hard choices. Everything in our daily lives tells us that. I'd be misleading you if I told you that Christian discipleship is any less demanding. But the rewards far exceed the price. Someone once said that Jesus Christ didn't come into the world to make bad people good. He did that. But really to make dead people alive. That is the possibility Christ offers you. The door is narrow, but it's wide enough for any who would come inside today. Let us pray. God, our Father, we pray that you would be working on each of our lives, opening our hearts and our minds to the possibility of truly following you. 
Help us understand what things in our lives need to be laid aside, at least temporarily, to do what you want us to do. To make sure that we have entered in that narrow door that will lead us to heaven. That we have made sure that we've made the right choices to lead to glory in your name and give meaning to our lives. There are so many wants in our lives, Father. Help us sort through them and understand what is truly essential and what is truly best for each and every one of us and for the ministry of our church. Amen.